so thank you very much for coming to Mezcaleando today. We are very, very happy uh, to receive this time uh, John Rexer, who is a, um, the guy who started Illegal Mezcal, uh, a New Yorkie, so a guy from New York who lives in uh, Mexico and also in Guatemala. And so he knows about a, uh, our culture. Uh, uh, tal vez hasta hablas español, ¿verdad, John? Seguramente hablas español y mejor que yo. Sí. Yo puedo hablar en español, pero creo es mejor para, para la gente en inglés, ¿no? Okay, okay. Well, we can do, we can do it in uh, Spanglish as you want. We can do it in uh, English. My English isn't perfect. So if I ask you something or I say something that you don't understand, please uh, ask me uh, to repeat. I will be super happy as sure. well for my English. <laughs> so welcome, welcome very much to this program, Escaleando. We start a new series. We will talk about with the people who uh, own the brands, who start brands, who put her mind, her health, her heart, and sometimes something more deep like a uh, the pocket in this fantastic industry that is the mezcal. So John, thank you very much. And uh, you know, I um, I love to start this program. Uh, the name of the program is Mezcaleando. So I really like to, to mezcalear. I don't know if it's a good time for you. Um, are you have a mezcal right now? I, I, I do, I'm important. drinking it. I'm drinking a little illegal reposado from a, a coffee cup. <laughs> yes, man, you know, I am, I am drinking my coffee cup too. Uh, for our friends, they need to know that we're recording this program, so it's early in the morning today. But you know, in Oaxaca, we drink mezcal with cafe, and uh, I'm not in my house right now. Uh, I am a little south, so I went to the store looking for a bottle because I didn't travel with my bottles, and I find this one. So I will uh, drink a, a, a vegan pechuga made with botanicals, uh, made from, by the Familia Morales, and I will put it in my coffee because it's what we do in the morning, right? <laughs> No, no Mondays, maybe, but then Sunday, why not? So, so, so cheers, John. Thank you very much for coming, and let's go start Mezcaliendo. Salud, salud. salud. This is very funny that we both started with our, with our coffee cups this morning. Yeah. I'm in, Dal I'm, I'm in Dallas right now, um, and like you, I'm not in my home, but I'm, I'm here visiting up in Texas. Yeah, yeah, well, a fantastic place. Texas is one of my favorite places to go, uh, frankly. The sun, the people, and these barbecues, man. Oh, man, I really love the ribs and all these fantastic meat, pieces of meat that you have there. So, so John, tell us a little bit what, we, we say something, you know, uh, uh, in my opinion is true, no everybody have to, uh, to be agree with me, but I think you are not looking for mezcal, mezcal find you. So when, when mezcal find you, when, when, when they came in your heart and uh, conquer your mind and say, mm, man, you are from here. So, you know, back in, God, I want to say it was the like mid nineties, I was traveling through Mexico and um, I was actually exporting some furniture out of Mexico up to the United States, mainly from Puebla, but from other places uh, and having some stuff made also uh, in and around Puebla and Cholula. And I, I was putting together containers of small containers of stuff to send back to New York uh, to an antique store. I was working with an antique store. And in between times of sending uh, uh, furniture and other things back up to New York, I would travel around Mexico. And I would go to Oaxaca, I would go, I would go over, I'd go to Veracruz, uh, you know, all over. And during that time, I started drinking a lot of mezcal. And I started falling in love. One, I fell in love with Mexico. I mean, that, that was why I was there in the first place. Um, and I lived in Puebla for a good while and fell in love with things like chilies and nogada and semitas and all the food. It was the first time I ever had huitlacoche. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really you know, beautiful. And then I traveled down to Oaxaca. And of course, you know, just fell in love with the countryside and all the different you know, just the different parts of Oaxaca, right? You know, you can go down to Puerto Escondido, you can be, you know, in, in, in Mezcal country. And I just really fell in love with sort of the pace of life, but also, and I've talked to people about this, you know, in Mexico, time changes. And I think everybody knows this, that you suddenly, uh, there's another there's another rhythm, there's another way of, it's, it's part of the light, it's part of the, 
it's part of um, the culture where you stop and you look at things and things become, at least for me personally, they become more tactile and more visceral and more sensual and more in touch with your with the senses. And, you know, I'm originally from New York where everything is, you know, like this and you're, you've got the energy and you've got the magic and you've got the, the bright lights and the big city, but you kind of get, get lost, lose some of the beautiful rhythms of life. So that was when I sort of fell in love with Mexican culture um, and agave spirits in particular, because I, I would often go down when I was waiting to load a container, I would go from Puebla down to Oaxaca and spend just weeks just sort of bouncing around Oaxaca. And sometimes it was to the coast, sometimes it was to some little village and and I would, you know, go to a small palenque, usually take a flete or something out there or catch a, catch a small cab out to some little town that I had never heard of, maybe eat some barbacoa, go to the market and drink mezcal. And I just like, wow, I really like this. So that was the, you know, that's the early days and sort of, you know, falling in love with, um, with all the things, you know, it is, to me, it's falling in love with sort of history, texture, and, and things that are, you know, connected to the senses. So, so tell me, you are one of these guys in Zipolite? <laughs> I went to Zipolite for sure. Maybe we uh, cross our paths there, right? because I think we are in the same generation, you and me, right? Yeah, Maybe probably. A little older than you, but yeah, certainly was 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 exactly a, a, a little bit my path, you know, the uh, the '90s. Uh, I spent all the time my vacations in that, that coast of Oaxaca and uh, Oaxaca City. Uh, Wow. I have adventures meant to coming back in a train with a uh, tack of chapulines in my belly and that's it, you know? Yeah. No money to come back and I just was going the train and say, oh my God, I hope I will come back home. And <laughs> I, I, I know that experience quite well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember this train? This train doesn't exist anymore. I know, man. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You make eight hours, nine hours to Mexico, man. And just to try to hide from the guy with the tickets because I don't have money. Oh man, what's... Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and you, you need a bottle of mezcal, right? Have the buses. You can never hide, so... <laughs> so so you, you discover Mexico, you discover mezcal, and what's happened after? Where, 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 where Illegal is born? How Illegal is born? When when the, when the story of Guatemala come, come here? So, um, like I said, I'm originally from New York, and... Um, in 1999 or so, I returned back to New York after traveling around for a good bit, traveling Mexico, exporting furniture, doing a number of things. And I traveled back to New York and was living in New York. And then when 9-11 happened um, and the towers came down, I lived fairly close to the towers at the time. Uh, I also knew I had people that I had grown up with who had been in the towers. And I, I you know, that whole thing was kind of, it was, it was. They changed the world, man. That changed the world. Changed the world, our world and the world, yeah. And, and there was a, a, a fleeting moment in New York where it actually, or at least I thought, it actually maybe had woken people up. And because you saw such community in New York City in the, the first couple of months after September 11, you know, downtown Manhattan was closed down, um, south of 14th Street, you know, all the way down. You couldn't get a subway, but people were offering people rides in their car. People were helping each other. People were setting up soup kitchens. And there was, there was a sense of people reaching out and really helping each other. Mm -hmm. And then in the months that followed, the anger, and sort of the nationalism all came about. And, you know, everybody had American flag in the back of their car on the Long Island Expressway, USA, USA. And I, I love the US, it's, it's, it's where I'm from. I, 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 I love it completely and I miss it often. But I just got this sense that I was feeling um, something pretty heavy and I didn't want to be a part of it. Uh, I was actually taking it you know, very much to heart that there was there was too much and maybe right anger, but it, I didn't feel the anger and I felt like this anger was not good. 
and I wanted to just be on the outside of the US and looking in. I wanted to try to like observe as a distant observer. And so I decided I had, I was living in the West Village of New York on Greenwich Avenue. And I decided that's it, I'm leaving. I am, I'm, I'm really leaving. I'm closing out my apartment. Um, I'm getting rid of everything and I need to, I need to go somewhere. I don't know where I'm going, but I need to just get away and sort of clear my head and uh, reassess. So I shut everything out and I said, you know what, the first place I'm just going to go is Mexico. I'm going to go Mexico because I love it and just um, take some books with me, not much else, um, and read. And I've got enough money to make it through a couple of months. I didn't have much more than that. And I'll try to figure it out. Everybody thought I was crazy. And I just said, you know, adios, vaya. <laughs> and I left. Yeah. Um, and I really didn't have a plan except for the fact that I, my plan was I'm pulling up roots and, and, you know, to get rid of you, as you know, as someone who's lived in California or New York, you know, when you get rid of a good apartment, people say you're crazy, right? Because <laughs> they're hard to get. And, oh, yeah. and, um, uh, I just, and that's a, a hard tide to cut. And I just cut it and said, see you. So I ended up back in Mexico. That was in 2000. Two. Yeah. And so from there, um, while living in Mexico, I stayed there, had very, very, uh, really no money. I was living uh, on the beach. And as a lot of, uh, you know, everybody knows Tulum today with all the, you know, the big hotels. And it's oh, like, yeah, yeah. like Cancun. It's so sad what's happening with Tulum, right? Very sad. I, I, was I, like paradise. I, it was paradise, man. And I lived in two places. I lived in a, a little place near the rooms on Tulum for $8 a night in a little palapa, a sandy floor, hammock, had some books. And then I lived later in a place for $80 a month in between the main road in Tulum and the beach called uh, La Valeta. Mm -hmm. And it was a series of little ten palapas in the jungle. Uh, most of the people there were from from Spain. There were some dancers, and it was it was a really interesting little group of people. There were ten palapas, and for a hundred dollars a month, and lived there for a while, and just just tried to figure out what the next move was. Read books, um, and it was it was paradise. Yeah, and if you know Tulum, right? Tulum back then really was paradise. Yeah. There was. There were no hotels. There were no big hotels. There was a dirt road, two dirt roads, and that was yes, it. And then true. one leading out to the beach. That's true. Uh, that's true. And uh, was was fantastic. The politics they have. They don't want to build nothing bigger than two floors. Like, and, yeah. And, and and but they, the other day I see some photos of people having party in the in the beach uh, there where the turtles should be um, yeah. given their eggs, and I was very disappointed. Um, yeah. Man, it's, it, I, I don't know what to tell about that, but it's, it's sad. But yeah, yeah, I, 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 I know what you're talking about. So it was a paradise, like in, in, in Cipolita, the same. You can live for nothing in yep. a beautiful place, and uh, you just don't need to be ready to whatever happens, right? Because a lot of things happen yeah. in these little towns. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, at one point around, I don't know, it must have been around March or so. I realized that I'd been in Mexico for a long time and had overstayed my visa. And it was time to, um, and back then actually overstaying your visa was a little problematic. Like you, you know, you got fines also, you couldn't come back in. So I decided that I was going to go somewhere and I decided to run down to Guatemala for Semana Santa, which is the big Holy Week festival Mm -hmm. uh, that's really, well, it's big throughout all of Mexico, obviously, but it's very big in Guatemala and in particular at the lake in Guatemala and in Antigua, which is where I now live. My plan was just to go down, see Guatemala, spend a little time there and come right back to, to Mexico. But I got down to Guatemala and um, really well two things happened one i ran completely out of money so, <laughs> so that's always a problem um and two i really I, I i adore mexico but there was something that i really fell in love with in 
I, I mean, I love both places completely, but there was something different in Guatemala that it felt smaller, which it is obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and because it was smaller, a little, there was something that was a little more wild about parts of it. But then you also have this beautiful little town, Antigua, Guatemala, which is very cosmopolitan in so many ways, right? You have people from all over the world who are coming to study Spanish. They're coming to study architecture, uh, Mayan culture. Um, and that's really fascinating to me. And so you've got this little town that I always tell people, like if, if you come to my bar, Cafe No Se, which I opened years, opened shortly thereafter, uh, if I've got 50 people in my bar, I've got 25 people from 25 countries and I'm from all walks of life, from indigenous people who maybe speak Kachikel to, you know, a president's son of Guatemala and someone from Sweden and someone from Japan. So it's just like this weird, wonderful. And Antigua's got this, um, you know, this beautiful thing. Not always, it has, its pro it has a lot of problems. But there's something really amazing. And I fell in love with this tiny. Have you been to Antigua? Uh, yes, I, I've been in Antigua. OK, yeah. so then you know. I, I didn't know very much because I just stayed one day. OK. But it's like it's like a mini, 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 mini Oaxaca. <laughs> yes, and, and it's, it's a fantastic all the uh, archaeological uh, stuff that is, 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 is in Antigua. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you are right. It's a very cosmopolitan city. Uh, and and uh, if I no wrong it's, it's, it's not very far away of the of the border with chiapas right so uh, guatemala is right on the border of chiapas so yeah, but antigua antigua is about five four and a half hours by car five hours by car uh from chiapas okay okay and the cultures are very the indigenous cultures you know it's maya country right it's maya country exactly yeah. exactly yeah yeah that, that is something that uh they put us uh, very very similar uh I, I know very well in, in Chiapas, Yucatan, Merida, and uh, you go down to uh, to Guatemala, and uh, yeah, they, they make very similar the country. So so you have these these cafe no se, they are uh, they start to be popular, and uh, where, where the mezcal is playing there. Okay, so yeah, I mean that's what we're here to talk about is mezcal. So um, so somehow with no money, and I mean really no money, I had four hundred bucks to my name. I rent the space. People have heard this story before, but on the on the side of town where there were no businesses, uh, one rainy afternoon when I had a few beers in me, I was trying to get out of the rain. I saw a for rent sign on a building and I just wanted to get out of the rain. It was rainy season. I knock on the door and a wonderful elderly gentleman comes to the door and he thinks I want to see the space to rent it. And we get talking. And all of a sudden, as we're talking, and he's, you know, he said, what would you like to put here? And it's a 500 year old building. Oh. The ceiling is all, most of it's gone. There's water that's running down because it's raining all over, all over the place. And it's a bit of a mess, the place. And he said, what do you want to put here? And I said, well, and it's a bunch of small rooms. In this room, maybe I put a little coffee, a little cafe, put live music in the corner here, a bar over here, maybe a bookstore. And as I'm saying this stuff, and I'm a little drunk, and I'm thinking, why am I telling him this? I don't even have any money. I'm just trying to get out of the rain. And I suddenly thought these are the things that I fell in love with when I was a little kid. These were, these were like my dreams when I was a little kid. And it really just hit me like, this is what you've wanted your whole life. You've always, I've always loved books. You've always wanted a bookstore. My father was in enter the entertainment world in New York and I grew up around musicians. I've always loved music. You've always wanted like a little bar with music. You love cafes. And suddenly as I'm saying this, I'm like, and he said, well, this is the rent. Uh, how, this is how much the rent is. And I said, well, okay, I think we can work with that but you have to give me a couple free months. He said, you seem like a nice guy. <laughs> We're yeah. speaking Spanglish at the time. And um, he says, okay. And he rents me the space. That is really and cool the story, man. It's, it's like, a, like a, the destiny put you there, right? Because, well, just to think it yourselves, going in New York in the rain and, and knocking any door, who will it. give you this, this welcome with the open arms if it's not a Latin American? 
right? Uh, and uh, also in a little city like like that, which may, maybe it's more, right? So, uh, so sometimes you don't have this idea to to to, to really the destiny put to put you there. I I think you're so right. Like I was at a point of sort of desperation. I was broke, right? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Broke. Yeah, I, I know that feeling, man. <laughs> I know yeah. that feeling. <laughs> and I could go, I could say, all right, I'm going to go back to New York and look for work and do something. And, but I had already made a commitment. I'm gone. I'm out of here. And so I was trying to think of like, you know, what do, what do you do? How do you exist in a different, well, this is probably what everybody who crosses the border from Mexico into the United States, what am I going to do? How do I exist in a different culture? How do I make something happen? You know, um, I'm not comparing my situation to somebody who's crossed the border by any stretch of the imagination. I vote a lot of privileges. I, I think, yes, you, 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 you live the, the uh, Latin American dream, man. <laughs> exactly. But I got to go, <laughs> yes. But um, I was, um, I, I, I think it's like the point where you take a risk because I was really scared. I was like, I just told this guy, I'm going to rent his bar. I have no money. I've been in town in Guatemala about three or four weeks. I know nobody. I have no money. On a drunken whim, suddenly all the things I've ever really wanted to do in my life suddenly just sort of hit me like a, like a diamond, like these are all the things. And now I'm going to do it, but how am I gonna do it? And what am I trying to do? And why am I doing this, right? Because you're like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not crazy if like you come, you've got a plan, you've got money. Yeah, yeah you don't have a business, business uh, structure, right? Yeah. It was not a business plan. So the life put you there and uh, you start developing it. Yeah. So you have the, your cafe, no say. Uh, and uh, and what, so what happened? You, you get so, the library, yeah, get you get the, the music. music. I, noticed I have a tendency to ramble on. So I want to make sure we get the mezcal. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, no, so, no. You know, we certainly we are talking about mezcal, but what is important for for us to know is uh, who is John Rexer, how they yeah. come in scene in the mezcal scene, and how he succeeds. So it's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for sharing all this. this. Is what I want to hear. No, my pleasure. Um, so you know, I the other from day one we had live music in this little bar as I was built here. Just I. To get back to what we were saying before, sometimes when you're scared, some and because this ties into mezcal um, and maybe selling mezcal and trying to create a brand and all of this. Sometimes when you're scared, when you have no money, and you have to use whatever creativity and resources you have, people come to you. So just as an example, I had no money. I had there. I I bought a hammer and a handsaw, and there was broken lumber in the back of this bar. And I had 400 bucks to my name and I opened the door and started building a bar out of broken old lumber in the back. And when people saw this person doing this, they're like, what are you doing, man? I'm opening a, I'm, I'm opening a bar. How are you going to build a bar with a handsaw like that? A German guy comes in and says, man, let me give you some power tools. I'm like, you're going to give me, he goes, no, I'll lend them to you. I got, he was a carpenter. Boom. I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. A Guatemalan musician comes in and says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm opening a bar. Can I play music? I said, yeah, well, when I open, he goes, how about now? I'll just started playing music. Some kids across the street, can I help you? I said, I have no money. Yeah, but I'm bored. And it's amazing what happens when you take a risk. That's true. So, and that's the same with mezcal. Like, coming people, through, be right? people become generous over when you're doing something exciting and you're taking a risk. So that's, yeah, just a, and I think that ties into, so that's what happens. So Cafe no Se became, popular again it was sort of like timing the town was 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 kind of lawless at the time and very international and there was a lot of excitement around and I was very fortunate like a lot of good people just showed up and made this place exciting and then about one year later the same landlord said I want to rent you a little space next door and I thought, I have no money. I'm still broke. I'm still not making any, I barely can pay. I was living in the bar at the time. At night, I would open the little window in the bar. I slept on two benches in the front of the bar and I would sell beer and booze out the window to make enough money 
people would knock at three or four in the morning. You have a to, ventana, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just to pay rent. Oh, I mean, yeah. Was, but, and, but everything started to catch on. There's this bar with really good live music and really international. And the owner lets people play and practice in the back of the place. And I, I was letting them practice because I wanted to hear good music and wanted to see people take a chance. And a year later, a space opened up next door to right next door to Cafe No Say by the same landlord. And he said, do you want it? And I thought, if I don't rent it, there's someone might move in there who doesn't like music, doesn't like people drinking, and I might have a problem. So I, I don't have enough money to rent it, but he's been a good landlord. His name is Don Julio, by the way. He passed oh, yeah. away, but uh, he became a great, great friend. Just a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, so I rented this other space from Don Julio and I started to build out the front space as a little, as a little mezcal bar, me agave spirits. I was going to bring down tequila, mezcal, sotol, bacanora, whatever, everything. And as I'm building it out, Don Julio comes to me and says, no, but you're next to a school. You can't do that. You have to be, you, they, this, it's against the law in Guatemala. And, you, and I'm like, oh, no. So I, my dream was to always have a bookstore. So I put the bookstore in front of the mezcal bar so that you either had to come on the street, all you saw was a bookstore. <laughs> you didn't see this yeah, little okay. mezcal bar. It wasn't a speakeasy. It was a speakeasy. <laughs> and so you had to come in through this. And I always wanted a bookstore anyway. So I, I, so I set up a little used bookstore. And then behind it was a little mezcal bar. And then from my main bar to get into the mezcal bar, this is before everybody did the fancy speakeasies in New York or whatever else. Um, I, you had to come in through the kitchen. And then later I knocked the hole through the wall and I had a old refrigerator door that was just lying in the back for years. At, that was about, you know, three and a half feet tall. It's like a mini refrigerator from the 1950s. Yeah. And I cut a hole in the wall and that became the entrance I mean, but you know, not like, this is not some fancy speakeasy. This is a rusty old refrigerator oh, door yeah. that, that <laughs> you have to bend through I, to go through. Yeah, yeah. So I, I built this space out and I was like, all right, now I need to get some agave spirits to Guatemala. And I was very foolish. I thought, you know, very foolish. I thought at least they'd have tequila in Guatemala. At the time, really all they had was Jose Cuervo. And you could find some old dusty bottles of Monte Alba, dusty. And I was like, shit, I told everybody I'm opening an agave spirits bar. There's nothing here. So that was when I started the journey back up to Oaxaca. And I took the, the ADO bus. I took a, I, you take a Galgos bus from, uh, from Escuintla up to the border at Tecu Oman. You cross from Tecu Oman which is on the border of Chiapas. Um, and then you go to Tapachula and Tapachula, you catch an, catch an Adeo Cristobal Colon bus that takes 14 hours. Yes, to Oaxaca. To Oaxaca. Yeah, yeah, I, so I, I did that bus also, yes. Yeah. From Chiapas to Oaxaca is wow. Yeah, it's a wow. Yeah, and a you wow. get to watch all these great like Kung Fu movies at, while you're <laughs> yes. on the bus. It's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, so I would take those buses up and, and I was going up, back up to Oaxaca that I remembered from years ago and looking for mezcal. And so what I would do is as the bus was coming into some town, as it crossed the border into Oaxaca, I would pull the cord if I saw like a village over somewhere, you could you know, looking at the bus at six in the morning or five in the morning, because that's when that audio bus comes mm -hmm. toward, towards Oaxaca out of Guatemala. And I'd see something, I'd pull the cord, I'd get off the bus and I'd walk towards the town. And if I got to the town, I would say, hey, um, you know, who makes mezcal in this village? Does, does anybody make mezcal? Like, oh yeah, yeah my, my uncle makes mezcal or my cousin, or I know somebody who does. Mm -hmm. I'd first sit there for a while, I'd drink some hot chocolate with somebody, you know, and then, mm -hmm. and then usually I would get somebody who'd say, would you like to see it? Or I'd hire like a, you know, a colectivo or a flete. And I'd go to a town and I would see, okay, wow, that's your uncle. That's really nice mezcal, great. I had a Polaroid camera with me. So I'd take some pictures of, okay. Polaroid, wow. man, wow. That, yeah, 
those are copper stills. So that's Olla de Barro. Okay. And oh, how do they make? And I would start, I was learning because I didn't know the whole years ago. I would just go, I drink, I taste it. But now I was sort of learning, like, okay, so a process. Okay, there's Olla de Barro, there's Pachuga. Okay, what Pachuga? Explain that shit to me. I don't get that, right? That's <laughs> weird. <laughs> and start drinking. And if I liked the mezcal, and it was really by like taste, if I like mezcal and I like the people. I'd say, okay, I'll buy two liters or five liters. And as you know, you get it like in a nice little green or red can mm -hmm. of yes, you know, yes, yes. a garafon. Yes, right? sometimes in shampoo bottles, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, but I would then take out my notebook. I'd like, I'd, I had a Sharpie with me and I would write like bottle one and then I'd take out my notebook and I write bottle one is from this town. It's from Santa Catarina Minas. So it's from yeah, yeah. the Sola de Vega. Or it's from wherever it was from. And I would write the style. I'd write the name of who was the distiller. And I'd collect 30 bottles and come back to, or as many as I could. Usually it was more like 20 bottles of 20 liters. And back then, Mezcal, in, you know, back in 2002, three, four, a good liter of mezcal, like a great liter of mezcal, was 40 pesos if you were buying an agronel. Mm -hmm. And if you were like a, but there was lots of good mezcal for 20 pesos. And I was just like, this is crazy. This is so, takes so long to make. And there's no one's making any money. This is crazy. This is, but anyway, I would take it back to Guatemala. Yeah, true, man. This, is, this is one of the problems of, uh, uh, or, or maybe, maybe I will not say one of the problems. Maybe this is one of the, uh, better things that happen with the mezcal independently of ab about all the problems and the boom is causing is that finally we bring them richness to all these people to have been doing this spirit for i will not say years for centuries we don't get anything else than whatever they can trade for right because you, you come in with some nice jacket and they will give you a little of mezcal for a jacket yeah you know, yeah. for some eggs. So, so this, this is this is a really great, uh, great point, man. So at that time they get in money because it was not a boom. So the mezcal they don't have too much value. So you bring them back to, to Guatemala and, and and how the how all these tourists and how our friends of Antigua they 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 receive that they was happy to drink something that they cannot find anywhere else in the in the full entire country. Yeah, I mean, I think one, there was so much mystique around mezcal. And even back then, like people really had no idea. You know, now people know mezcal or not everybody, but enough people know. But back then, is it mezcaline? Is it hallucinogenic? You know, I hear that. I hear that. Also. <laughs> and you're bringing it back in a bottle that is, you know, we bring it back in a garrafon. I put it in some other bottle, put a handmade label on it. And people are like, what are we drinking, you know? And then I'd show them Polaroid pictures and like, wow, man, that's where that's from. And then, so people became, uh, and I had a lot of friends who loved my bar. So I was very enthusiastic about it also, right? You know, like, you gotta check this out. And people loved, I mean, just loved it. They loved the stories. Can I I go up with you. Next time I go up, you know, if you can only bring back 20 bottles now. If I come up back, we can bring back 40 and I can help you because they wanted to see Oaxaca because, you know, mm. you're Mexican. We think every, you know, I've lived down in Guatemala for so long and spent so much time in Mexico. We think everybody knows it, but, you know, most foreigners know Cancun, Mexico City, San Miguel Allende. They don't know Mexico. They don't know. They know or Baja California. California. Yeah. And they don't know this whole other beautiful part of the country. And so, so the reception was really, really good. Plus, um, the, my mezcal bar, my little agave spirits bar, because back then we were calling it the tequila bar, the mezcal bar, agave bar. We didn't even really have a name for it in the beginning. Was It's a small little space. And we, I started out saying, everybody has to have a two-shot minimum. And I know people say you don't shoot mezcal or whatever else, but I mean, you have two drinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason I wanted that is I've always believed in like, 
you need to figure out how to get people to like break the ice and create a little craziness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to like get people to get the energy right uh, yeah yeah get, get the inside of their of their system yeah get, yeah like agave go to the heart yeah i'm right? with you so. yeah yeah they go directly to the heart of anyone yeah. so yeah so, nice things can happen but also they can happen where very good stuff right yeah it's very passionate drink so we had a two shot minimum like you come in you know and you know the only way you could not have two shots is if if you were pregnant that was it <laughs> um, and and so um it created this crazy energy and as we all i, I think most people know you know different alcohols give you a different a different a different sentido different mm -hmm. different energy yes totally totally you need to get rum there, right? Yeah. If yep. you are in a date, get mezcal. It's easy. Yep. The things yep. are very, very easy after that. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, um, so it was it was really cool. I mean, it was really good to see that suddenly the energy that it created, and there was a lot of people who were like, I love this. Uh, can I be your mezcal bartender? This uh, can I come up with? Can I try, come with you? Um, and I was like, yeah, I would love to show you what I, why I love mezcal, why I love, why I fell in love with it. And I was, the more I thought about it, like originally, like I didn't, you don't deconstruct why you fall in love with something. You're just like, but after a while, you suddenly think, oh, yeah, why do I like this? I like this because it's, it's, it's so the opposite of the modern world. Mm -hmm. It's. It's, it is not industrial, all those things we all talk about, right? But it's so the opposite of it, where people, there's actually people, there's actually, um, one of the first palenques I went into, um, uh, I didn't, you know, they're like, well, come on in and first let's have lunch before we, you know, I'm like, you're inviting me to lunch? I don't even know who you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have lunch, we sit down, I meet the whole family. And two hours later, then, okay, let's talk about Mezcal. And this is in 2003 or four, you know, and so many of those experiences that is just, it's a different Mexico. It's a different world. For, yes, yes it, it, when you talk business with a Latino guy, normally they, they can be two hours at least conversation. When, when, when uh, you need to talk with somebody- In Zapotec. I know it's <laughs> just that you go meet him, Talk about the business. Thirty minutes, goodbye. Think nice to meet you, but with the Latino people, that are, you need to know the name of the photos of all their family. You need to know where they come from. They want to know where you come from. They want to see what is inside of you, and uh, also the hospitality, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's something important. And also, where we talk about all these properties of the mezcal that is is going inside of you, and they let you go outside and. And, and, and make you a, a better person, in my, in my opinion, right? It depends on each person. Uh, the alcohol is, can change the people for, 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 uh, for another no, course, and, and they cannot be good, but, but normally the mezcal is, is good and they go well and, and they make the people more happy. So you are in uh, selling these, these mezcal, where, where, where they born your idea to have a brand? So like we we're talking about Antigua is like Oaxaca you know it's very international I think actually Antigua as a little town is more international and yeah. so people started writing about this crazy little bar that I have um, and when I say I have I mean it's my bar but it's like the musicians and my bartenders who really kind of made it famous because they did beautiful things there mm. and and the people who came into the bar and people from Antigua and so so my bar started getting written up in the New York Times, the Financial Times, it's all sorts of things as this crazy little bar that um, has live music seven days a week from all over the world, that has a bookstore that runs a crazy poker game from nine o'clock at night until nine o'clock in the morning, two nights a week, um, and some amazing mezcal from Oaxaca. And so people started writing me because this is like, by the time we got to like 2005, the 2005, 2006, the whole uh, craft cocktail uh, resurgence was happening. And people started to read it, read this. And I got emails and phone calls. Hey, can we get your brand of Mezcal? 
And I was like, I don't have a brand of mezcal. Um, what I have is beautiful mezcals that I've liked, that I've sort of hand selected from different towns that I'm in love with, but happy to send you a bottle uh, to you up in New York or California or London or Chicago, because it really happened like all the time. I've got customers who are going back. I'll, I'll send you two bottles. They'll be like in an old Jack Daniels bottle, but don't you worry or whatever. I put them in some <laughs> bottle and put a label on it, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. I'll send it up. And I, this happened a lot. And I started thinking like, this is interesting. There, there's great mezcal in Oaxaca um, and really beautiful distillers, palenqueros, mezcaleros, who are really making beautiful mezcal, but it doesn't make it out of. And I don't know everything about it. I actually know very little, but I know some producers that I like, and maybe I should start thinking about making a brand. Let's see. It, it's interesting because people are asking me for it. And so I sat down and thought, okay, this is, you know, wow, you got something small really, really small, 200 liter, 250 liter copper stills, smaller olla de barro. How do you make a brand out of that without fucking up the thing you fell in love with, right? Mm -hmm. Because you also don't want to destroy the beautiful thing you fell in love with. So I thought, all right, first of all, all the mezcal that I'm bringing into Guatemala is uncertified. It's, um, it's, it is unbottled, really. Some of it was bottled, but most of it was agranel. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just liquid. Mm -hmm. And yeah, two liters. And, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so first, I have to get it legal into Guatemala because I was, you know, let's just say I was not passing the border in the most, um, you know, legal way. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, um, so I thought, let's first do this really slowly. Let's see if we can work to, we, I knew the CRM was in process and brands were not brands and a few people were getting certified for export, but that was just really developing back in 2003, four. It was very early still. Um, and let's see if the I can get it into Guatemala legally. And let's just learn the process of importation a little bit because I'm a bar owner but I don't know anything about importation exportation I know I know it from from furniture but I don't know anything about it for liquor mm -hmm. and um and I don't know if any of these people I'm working with want to grow big or even have the ability and so let's just poco poco no hay prisa tranquilo camilo yeah 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 tranquilo, <laughs> And um, so that's what I did. So I, I grabbed one or two friends who were working in the bar and I said, you know, a couple of them really love the mezcal. And I said, you know, maybe we're going to do this. We're going to do it really slowly. And let's first see if we can get it into Guatemala. Um, let's see if we can find people that we like to work with and trust. And this is going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. I don't have any money. I'm still having trouble paying my bills in the bar. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, like, you know, like it's every month, like, okay, whew, we just made it, right? You know, that kind of thing. I'm not paying myself any money. I think I had just finally moved out of living in the bar, sleeping on benches. You know, this was crazy. Um, so let's do this really slowly. Let's develop the label ourselves, the bottle ourselves. Let's see what people like in the little tequila mezcal bar and see what people see. If they like the mezcal, let's just chill. Let's do it. Let's chill and not chill because I'm also still a New Yorker, right? So you let's start build. Way. You just start build something, right? Yeah, yeah. You build, it, you build with uh, time. It's, 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 it's a nice thing that yeah. maybe don't have too much money help to do, right? To say, okay, let's go take it easy, take it easy because they would be much better for yeah. for me uh, and, yeah. and go very fast. Yeah. So that was really where it all began, and then by about. 2006, seven, I was like, wow, we are really one. There's a lot of people who are really interested in mezcal, a lot. It was the, it was the world of, of, of craft cocktail mixology. Everybody was looking for 
the real authentic spirits and what are left because that whole group of people really cared about quality and cared about all the things that we should care about, right? You know, transparency, sustainability, all of those things and taste. And so, so we just work slowly. And um, in, I don't know what year it was, maybe 2009, a mixologist had won a big, big contest in New York with the Star Chefs Award, which is a big thing for chefs across the United States. Um, and it was the first time, I, I believe it was the first time they had invited a mixologist into the Star Chefs Award uh, because mixology was becoming big at that point. And he had won with a cocktail that he had put illegal in. The only problem was I had named the, I'd already named the brand I was going to create illegal because I had, as lots of people know and have heard about, you know, we crossed the border a lot of times in a lot of different ways, not all that legally to get mezcal into Guatemala. Um, and I had made up labels that said illegal, but we were not certified. We had nothing like together, but I had sent him bottles. He had won the Star Chefs Award and asked me to bring, I don't know, five, 10 cases to New York for a big massive celebration event with all the star chefs. And at that moment, I suddenly realized, wow, we've really created something. And we got Mezcal to New York. And while in New York, um, with our Mezcal, a distributor approached us or an importer approached us and said, would you like to import through us? <coughs> and we weren't ready for it, um, but I was, I was like, okay, this is great. This is really, okay, let's, let's thing, yeah. get ourselves in position to, to do this. Yeah, you, you already noticed that in, in the United States at that time, uh, the mezcal started being selling in, in, in the shelves. In 2000. Yeah, when the, this contest happened, 2004, you said? No, no, this was in 2009. And no, there was very, there was almost no real, as you probably know, right? Because you guys were. Probably... We arrived in 2010 with the first bottle, but we created in 2008 because we noticed, we noticed that uh, was not too many brands yet. Uh, right. Yeah, my, me and my friends, we tried to do that in uh, when the tequila, when we were young, but when you are young, you don't have money and uh, it was impossible. And when we finally finished uh, whatever is your first step on life, right? Uh, we noticed that uh, the tequila was already there and it was impossible to attract. So, so mezcal was born and, and we, we've been in love and we did it, but uh, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit in the same age, the same yeah. year. Yeah, so from there to, 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 to have this fantastic creativity, you know, I, I think uh, your marketing is fantastic. It's the way that you touch the buttons of the people with each time that you make uh, some marketing things outside, you know, the rabbits, uh, the, even the name illegal or uh, Tromper es un pendejo. Those things, they really was a genius thing. Where, where they come from, this creativity, this, uh, this, this provocation, because at the end of the day, if, if the three rabbits is a big provocation and uh, Tromper es un pendejo, oh my God, I, I, I see people coming red. After, after these t-shirts and these posters and these beautiful lights in New York. Um, something you. that uh, you make us proud of the Mexicans when we saw that, man, let me tell you. Uh, that's, that's really nice of you. Huevos to do that is incredible, it's fantastic. Well, I, I have a slight problem that I really don't trust authority. So, <laughs> um, but um, I guess- in of Mexico, huh? Yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Oaxaca. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Man. <laughs> um, um, I, it came from a couple of things, right? I, I'm not really from the liquor business. I may have a bar, but and, you know, like you, we're not from the liquor business. We we found something we love, and so we play by slightly different rules. And I. When I started this, one of the things I said was I never want to just sell mezcal. I mean, I want to sort of 
bring the things that are happening in my bar cafe no say which is music which is people we, we created a magazine people who write some energy and like no 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 we're not here to play by the same rules but i also don't i also want to make people like um laugh and enjoy and be a little provocative so you know we all know the story of my ol and the rabbits and all of that but i thought okay that's cool and it's nice for a history lesson but how do you make it something like that um one how do you promote your brand when you have no money because we also had no no money when we were starting illegal well you need i was like all right let's make people laugh make something provocative something that connects to the story of my ol so when suddenly someone says what are the three rabbits about man well and how does that what's that about mesca well but they've already laughed and they've already like that's cool and that's bold and then you can start talking about the history of mesca through my ol because people have asked the first question or if you want to if you don't want to if you just want to say well you know there's rabbits and but well, you know so it was how could you do a lot with a little money how could you connect to people by being making them stop and look because if you can't make them stop and look they're not going to pay attention how are you going to like brighten up their day and make them laugh a little bit because at the end of the day you know you want people to have a little more spark in their life and so put that all in one package so the idea of the three rabbits was you know i read about the story about my ol it's an interesting story you see mexican you see, telenovela man yeah you see the hieroglyphs yeah you see the whole thing yes yeah, it's, it's the first mexican telenovela for sure yeah yeah, yeah. Totally. All mezcal is a telenovela. All mezcal. <laughs> Each time that a news come out, yeah. we figure out the way to make it a telenovela, you know, and uh, you have a villain that is normally the CRM, you have a big team that normally they are the destilados, and uh, you have all these brands, they are just uh, destroying the system, etc, etc, and, uh, and, and uh, it's always the same telenovela, right? And, Have you seen uh, Monarca yet? Say again? Have you seen Monarca? Oh, oh no yet no 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 I, I i i run of this one but i maybe i will not be uh able to escape forever but i hear about this it's a family to sell mezcal tequila right it's it's just um yeah you have to stand back a little bit from it and watch it like maybe very far back but it's <laughs> worth watching <Yeah>. okay okay <laughs> Okay, I, I, maybe I, I will see it, but yeah, this is this is Mexico. I love that, you know, it's part of our culture. But it sounds like but what you we were need just to talking make about. Everything a drama, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you you get this this rabbit because it's part of the the story of Mayagüel, and okay. well, after we have this this tremendous uh, wave of hate, they hit United States. So, so you you went uh, under the Trump es un pendejo. Uh, they 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 cause you problems. That yeah, so that. The, sto the story behind that is I was in July, or I think it was July, right after Trump came down the towers and said Mexicans are rapists and murderers and mm -hmm. some of them maybe are nice people. I was in, I was up in New York and I was in a restaurant um, outdoors and um, I could see all these delivery people going in and out. And I turned to the person I was with and I said, I bet you these guys are from Puebla. I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, no, I lived in Puebla. I, I, I bet you they're from Puebla. Also, you know, most Mexicans in New York are from Puebla. So it was a pretty yes, good bet. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In Chicago, they're from the, the F.A. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in yeah. New York, they come from Puebla. Yeah. In West Coast, they're coming from Michoacan. Yeah, that, the family from the family, yes. Yeah. So the waiter came over and I said, hey, man, where are you from? He said, I'm from Puebla. And I said, oh, I love Puebla. I used to live in El Parian. I uh, love Semitas, chilies in Nogada. You know, we talked food. And I, I told him I lived there. And he said to me, man, I am so happy to know everybody is not like Donald. And I said, no, people love Mexico, man. I, he's, he's a dick. And he said, Donald is un pendejo. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, he's a fucking asshole, man. I, mean, I hope I can say this on your show. I'm sorry. Yes, you can. You can talk. Okay. This is an adult <laughs> show, man. <laughs> and so I wrote it on a napkin. And, and I just felt, I could see like the real hurt in his face. And I thought, 
Now this is in 2015. And by that time I had, you know, we work with lots of Mexicans in Mexico, obviously in Oaxaca. I've got a bunch of Mexican Americans who work for me. I've got people from El Salvador who work for me, people from Guatemala who work for me. I always hate to say that they work with me. I don't work for me. They work because we're really we're like that, who work with me. And I thought, man, that's probably how so many people from south of the border feel right now that not only like, offended but hurt because this guy really had a hurt in his face so i woke up the next morning saw on the napkin don lesson pendejo that i wrote down and i called my niece kalen who works with me who's our marketing our chief marketing person she does makes all these things beautiful i said come over we got to sit down and talk i want to make a some street graffiti that's like an outline of donald and i want to say don lesson pendejo and we made these posters and Herminio Torres, who works for me, who's Mexican American and good friend who's been with Illegal for, I don't know how many years, 12 years, 10 years, something like that, wrote me and said, no, 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 Eres, he put it in his face, Donald, you are an asshole. So we changed it and we put up the first 500, then a thousand, then 2000 posters. And we did it ourselves all by ourselves. Wow. Across Manhattan. And that was how that came, but it wasn't like a marketing campaign, just like the rabbits weren't really a marketing campaign. I thought like, that's cool. That'll make people, I'm not thinking about making campaigns. I'm thinking like, that's cool. That'll make people laugh or that's cool. And that'll make people think, or that's cool. And it's like, how dare you say this about people, dude, and we're going to shove it in your face kind of thing. Wow, that, that is, that is really, really cool, man. Really yeah. cool. Uh, uh, you really touch a, uh, a nerve there, and and it's 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 great. It's great. So, uh, question that I'm pretty sure everybody wants to know: Why reposado? Why añejo? And uh, when uh, when the espadín? I, I study that a lot, so I can tell you that reposado and añejo they are totally part of the tradition. So it, it's just a stupid thing to say that reposados and añejos are not traditional because. Well, the, the mezcal was transported in wood since day one. So, so uh, I, I will not go there. But what I want to see is why you thinking in, in was because you was try to relate a little bit uh, with the tequila. What was what was your intention to get the reposado and añejo, obviously the blanco, and bring them like that? Okay, so the first part that you just said, just really quick, um, is it's definitely part of the tradition and. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, I would say, you know, five out of 10 palenques that I went to over the years, they'd say, hey, now you have to try this. And they've taken me to some place where they had something in a room that was aged. Yeah. So, um, but here's why. In, in, and maybe this talks about for all brands trying to sell mezcal. I looked and I saw other brands that are good brands bringing in seven Silvestres, 10 Silvestres, five Silvestres. And I thought, okay, first of all, I like Espadine. I like it. That's what I like the most. Yeah. I really like it. Two. It's the, king. it's the king of the streets in the United States right now. <laughs> Two, it's the most grown. So it has the ability to be hopefully the most sustainable right now because it's actually being cultivated because Silvestre is wild and by its nature, if everybody starts pulling the wild agaves. And it's what, happening, it's happening. What happens? But people are beginning to plant now and be really smart about it too, which is great. So, mm -hmm. so I thought, okay, so that's why I want Espedim. One, I like it. And two, I think it has the chance if I'm gonna to try to make a business to be sustainable. And then I thought, okay, I like, every time I've tried a Hoven Reposada Añejo, I like it. And then I thought, what are we trying to do? This We have a very hard job, especially back in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. People thought mezcal was this bad tequila with a worm in it that was kind of an ugly yellow color. And I thought that's what we have to do. If, if we want people to drink it, I know it's good. You know it's good. But there has to be a way of one, making them accept it, and two, educating them to the quality of this. So 
I know there's good Reposado. I know there's good Añejo. I like aged spirits. Tequila already has that presentation. So it's not hard for them to digest. Mm -hmm. And I love Silvestre. It's God, I love them. But as a bar owner, I own a bar. And if you walked in to my bar, even right now with 10 Silvestres, I'd be like, I love you, but I really have to think about this because it's very hard to for a bartender to talk to the people about all that stuff that's up there. Yeah, get it. Because we're trying to create a category. If it was scotch that's been around forever, I mean, mezcal has been around forever, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been popular forever outside of Mexico. Totally. It's not a hard job. But for something like mezcal, where you first want them not to be afraid of it, then you want them to get rid of this idea that it's the bad stuff with the worm. You want them to know this is the great stuff that's made so carefully and takes so long and is so good. Make it simple and give them something they can relate to. Um, and something that, well, I drink whiskey, man. I don't drink white spirits. Well, we have a beautiful Reposado. And by the way, if you really like dark spirits, Mezcal really pulled some wonderful things from oak and you should try this. All right, well, now they'll try it. Two, because I, I think you told me this call was really about maybe how, about marketing for, for brands. For me, and I, everybody's experience is different. For me, I thought, make it simple and clear, but also as a bar owner, when I know I've got three things sitting on a shelf, three kinds of tequila, three kinds of a, a, a brand of rum. It, it shelf space, people see it, people, and if there's differentiation, but if you have 15, the bar owner just loses money because just three of the bottles just sit there. One, and, of, the, one of the big problems of the mezcal right now in the United States is that, John, is uh, we have too many bottles for years in the shelves. So the new mezcals, they come in, they don't have a space in the shelf, so they will not be drunk, drink, right? And, uh, and and you still have it, a big production in Mexico, people exporting to the United States, but the bottles are inside of the boxes, inside of the warehouse, you know, in the shelf, because five years ago, the people buy the full collection of each brand with 20, 15, eight, seven mezcals, and the people will not buy a 70, 50, 60 dollar shot. Right. Right? So if you don't know the, the drink, no, you will not. Now they are buying the bottles because they have an extra money because they don't go on vacation, they uh, don't they spend gas, they don't have to go to work and they receive a salary and they don't travel anymore. So they have an extra money. So they go in the, in the liquor stores and they buy a beautiful bottle with a really nice agave, but in the bars, if you don't know the brand, if you don't have a lot of money, you will not pay a $50 shot. You know, normally the people spend between $10 and $15. If you are a little more wealthy and uh, you can pay $20, $25, but uh, going another extreme is, is only for your birthday, right? So you have all these bottles stopped in the bars with the beautiful agaves, a beautiful arroqueños and tepestates made in the old fashion. Then nobody's drinking and uh, the people are still producing Mexico. So we are not sustainable right now. I, I, I think that's, again, as a bar owner is, so I, I think of things in a bunch of different ways, right? Because we have a legal and I have, I have a bar in Oaxaca and I've got bar, two bars in, in Guatemala and, and have partnered in bars in other places and Ideally, you want to buy everything, but then you sit there and you say, that stuff that's sitting there is not moving, is just cash money sitting on my shelf that could go to all sorts of better things and is jeopardizing my business. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, and it, we all know this happens, if you're in a tienda, if you're in off-premise, if you're in, and it doesn't turn, and let's say three brands of mezcal don't sell, the next time someone comes in with a great mezcal at a good price, the tienda says, I don't want it. I have mezcals that don't sell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the mezcal is not good. It's because in this world we, that we live in, especially when you, I think, this is my, one man's opinion, when you start something, it is if you have too many options, 
you get confused. And if every time you try a mezcal because you're just learning about mezcal, one day, oh, I'm gonna buy a bottle of mezcal. You don't know enough, you're not, you're not a nerd. You're just going in to buy it because you've heard about it and you grab an araqueño at 48%. And you're like, what? I can't drink that. You wouldn't go and do that with like a really smoky, peaty. Yes, yes. Scotch, right? You'd start yeah. out with something that like a, a Johnny Walker Red or something, so that so that people get comfortable with the category first. And 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 you wouldn't give people a hundred things to choose from. You'd say, here are five, or here are three, or here's one. And 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 so I think something i think all the silvestres have a place i think the silvestres and the varietals are wonderful and they are going to do really really well um but my position was for now stick with something that makes people that is so clear hoven rape a mouth not a lot of smoke because as I spoke to, and I, as I would travel through Oaxaca, so many people would say, no, I would taste it. Like, there's no smoke. No, why would you want to taste smoke? Well, I thought mezcal was smoky. No, you want to taste the agave. Mm -hmm. You want to, the plant takes six, eight, 10 years to grow. Why do you want to, or 20 years? Mm -hmm. You don't want to cover the flavor with smoke. I'm like, okay, I get it. Smoke should be like an afterthought. I get it, okay, I'm tasting. So that, exactly. Why not give people this beautiful expression of the flavor of agave, make it really simple and clean to understand. And if we do that with Illegal, and there are other brands doing the same thing, who have like one, one, one expression or two or three, if we do that and are successful at that, people will get to know mezcal. And if we're consistently, you're tasting good agave and it's smooth and you can put it in a cocktail or you can drink it neat, then the varietals over time, the silvestres, people will also experiment and fall in love with and it helps everybody. Mm -hmm. But if, if there aren't one, two, three brands that succeed in getting everybody to like mezcal, then nobody succeeds. It's sort of how I was thinking. I'm not sure I'm right. No, no, this no, is just no. one it's, man's opinion. It's, it's, it's a very, very uh, valuable uh, opinion. And I really appreciate that this. Uh, uh, I, I always have this, uh, this idea. I think it's a great, it's fantastic. I, I think you are, if not the only one, one of the only ones they can uh, show to the public what is a mezcal uh, añejo, right? Uh, Reposado, I love Reposado. So we are not, we are less brands, but we are some other brands that we, we promote a, a Reposado in the market. That is good. But it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great point, man. The, the Spadin is still be the boss, the big boss is the most sustainable. Certainly now all the fields of Oaxaca, now Michoacan are just a field of, of, of agaves. So, so we need to, to, uh, to use in those, right? Uh, so, so I think it was, was, a, was a great idea. So, uh, what 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 is what is coming? What what is the next uh, step? Uh, we are just to finish this. Uh, we we start we talking that before we start this program about the COVID uh, was a big hit for our hearts, for our families, for our growing, for everything. And now we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we are not out yet, but we are. So, in, in your opinion, what follow? What 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 are your plans, uh, John? What what where are you going? in uh as, as a person and where are you going as a brand god i don't know um <laughs> well it's, it's very valid it's a very very valid answer man <laughs> no i i actually have some thoughts on this so and it's not just for um illegal because i truly believe if illegal and one or two other brands are the only brands out there we lose the whole category, there's one, there's so much good mezcal out there and so many good, Oaxaca's a beautiful brand, Tozba's a beautiful brand, Real Manero, you can just go on the list. Um, I'm, I'm in, I was in Dallas, I'm in Dallas and I was in a restaurant yesterday 
and um, it, it's, you know, it's lots of mezcals. I was in a bar. I had never had banyas. Um, I don't know anything about banyas, but I tried an espadin baril, and because they didn't have illegal, and that was the only mezcal they had. And I was like, all right, I'm enjoying this. This is good. And the price was good. This is interesting. Okay. Don't know. I don't know anything. Here's my, my feeling is that agave for, for people who are making mezcal, I believe that it's going to continue to grow. I can see, and we can all know the investments of like big companies and all of that that's happening down there. And I truly am trying, we're working, you can ask Gilbert, you can ask everybody to make sure that the thing we fell in love with, as I said earlier, you help stay the beautiful thing you fell in love with by not letting it become industrial, by caring about the environment, learning from some of the problems and mistakes up in Jalisco, like with biodiversity and all of that. No, you have to have biodiversity. Otherwise you mess up, your, you mess up the whole area. Um, but what I think is happening right now, and it's, this is very good for mezcal, is tequila is on this crazy boom, crazy boom. And whether you like it or not, LeBron James, The Rock, everybody has gotten involved in tequila. And LeBron James has gotten involved in mezcal. You have a bunch of celebrities who have gotten involved in mezcal also. In COVID, agave spirits, mainly tequila, did so incredibly well. And, I, and it was all like anything above 30, $35, like premium and up, up, up. There is going to be a big boom in tequila. And I think there's going to be a big boom in, in mezcal because of tequila, because people are understanding it. They're beginning to love it. And because you, whether you want the celebrities in the mezcal space or not, they are there and they're going to bring popularity to it. Yeah. So I think that's very the positive part for that, in my opinion. There's a negative part, but the positive part is if done right, it, it one increases the value of everything around mezcal. So people actually get paid for growing agave. Um, there are more jobs. People don't have to, if you, if you know better than I do, in Santiago Matatlan in the 90s and early 2000s, 50% of the people there tried to go to the United States for work because you couldn't make money with Mezcal. People are coming home, taxi drivers, people who are opening tiendas, all of this is beautiful and people want to be home. That's of kind course, of, cool. of course, they want to see their family again. Yeah. People don't understand that part of the immigration, right? And you cannot come back and it, this is, this is a, it's a heartbreaking thing, right? And you cannot see your parents, your kids or your beloved again. Because but you're this, old in jail. Exactly. And the risk now, the risk is even like crazier, but people still want to go, you know? Mm -hmm. and well, yes, yes, yes. Also, also, also now you, you know, in the past you have a very nice people to put water for you. And now you have really bad people to put poison for you. So yeah. it's, uh, it's yep. crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And, and, and so the mezcal, I know they put their little, uh, piece of sand to help uh, the communities to stay together, to don't have to come or go to the United States for necessity. Um, the master distillers are coming back to their towns because no, they, the mezcal is working for them and they are making money with that. And this is, this is incredible. This is, uh, this is a really nice uh, part of the social justice because for years and years and years, was the end of our social uh, communities, social organization. And now, even if they still as a, a lot of them indigenous and a very, uh, um, how can I say that? And, and you know, Mexico is, is also a very racist uh, society. So uh, now these, these people have also the possibility to uh, growing economically and, and getting out of, of, of all these um, things that happen around them. 
So I, this, is, this is something that I celebrate in Mezcal and it's, it's happening thanks of people as you, John. So thank you very much. You know, your uh, testimonial today is a very valuable. I, I don't know how to thank you for, for giving us to us and, and, um, and share all these fantastic opinions. Thank you. I, other way around, thank you. I've, I've, been, um, I've been really lucky to somehow, um, you know, fall into Mexico and, and then fall into Oaxaca. And a, a lot of this was, um, as you said, you know, by chance. And um, I thank you because it's been, it's, it's been hard. It's been crazy. There've been times when I thought, what the hell am I doing? And this is not going to work. Um, and all I can say is, um, you know, as I think, can I end this in a certain way? Cause I just want to say something. It's like, there's a real double-edged sword of like mezcal becoming commercialized and big in the world and do destroy the beautiful thing that everybody really cares about in Oaxaca and everywhere else, right? Does it become industrial or whatever else? And I think that there's a lot of things that are very positive about mezcal becoming popularized because it, it, it creates jobs, it brings people back to community, it brings back the tradition of mezcal because when I was there in 2002, three, in, in the 90s, that most of the palenques were closed because no one could make any money. Yeah. And now family businesses are coming back. That, and the tradition is coming back. And people often think commercialization is gonna kill the tradition, it could. Yeah. And so that's the other part that we have to be careful about. I think that your brand, our brand, a bunch of good brands somehow have to work together to try to figure out how to make it sustainable long-term, make sure everybody from the guys cutting the agave to the bartenders all the way at the other end are actually making some money so that it's everybody sustainable in here. And it's hard. And that the, the respect for the tradition um, stays in place meaning you really care about if you're artisanal mezcal or if you're traditional mezcal that you really live up to those to those things um so that because i think the value of mes as a commercial product something that you're gonna sell anywhere in the world the value is that it's actually done the way you say you're going to make it and really respects the things you care about and that's the that's eso es el oro mm -hmm, mm -hmm. De acuerdo, de acuerdo, yeah. de acuerdo. And, and uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I totally agree with you. We need to, to preserve that and uh, see the way that we can all work together. Uh, right now we have two kinds of, of mezcals and you have the mezcal of, uh, I call mezcal de autor, a mezcal they are made by a master distiller, but you also have a mezcal made by a chemistry. And uh, sometimes you don't notice the difference. Uh, so, I, I, it's, it's incredible how, how where we going. I don't know where we're going. I really, uh, it's, I don't know where we're going really. Uh, I guess we will, the, the category will, it will be popular and I hope they can keep their soul because when the money is around, uh, sometimes the soul is, uh, the soul of something is for sale and, and this is no good for the, this category and this fantastic product. But let's go see what's happened. I, I really hope I, I, ca I can cross my path with you very soon. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's a good time for me to come back to Antigua, or maybe uh, maybe see you in Oaxaca one of these days, or maybe when you come back in Texas or New York. Cool, man. I'll be in I'll be in um, Oaxaca around the 14th of April, and I'll be in Texas around the 30th of March. So I will uh, I'll I'll just drop you a line, and, and if we can cross paths, we'll figure it out, or we'll figure it out later. Cool. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course, and. Uh, and uh, well, I, I'm, I'm sure I will still see your, your uh, fantastic mezcal everywhere and, um, and your people that are fantastic people. Thank you very much, uh, John, for receiving me, for, for talking to us about uh, your experience and everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish you the best of the luck. And um, I, maybe we will have uh, the opportunity also to make another program one of these days. Thank you, man. Un placer. Bueno.